This is Pastor Paul Jennings with Pastor Paul's House of God podcast. Hogcast number eight. What's wrong with Calvinism? Welcome to today's Hogcast. What's wrong with Calvinism? Is there anything wrong with Calvinism? Calvinism is all over the internet. Calvinist preachers, Calvinist churches, Calvinist mega churches, uh, Calvinist t-shirts, coffee mugs, even Calvinist beers, so I'm told, and Calvinist tattoos. In short, Calvinism is popular. Maybe even Calvinism is cool. I don't know. But what is Calvinism? Calvinism is a way of interpreting the Bible that takes its name from the theologian John Calvin, although there seems to have been some development of his ideas since its beginning. It is characterized by the five points of Calvinism, five points of doctrine, uh, which is also known as tulip, after the first letter of each point. Uh, Point one uh, being T for total depravity. Point two being U for unconditional election. Point three, being L for limited atonement. Point four, being I for irresistible grace. Point five, being P for perseverance of the saints. But we'll get into these in in just a moment. But it's worth pointing out that Calvinism is also known by other names. And this for me is, this is probably for me, where some of the trouble uh, really begins. Uh, Calvinists lay claim to things that are not uh, exclusive to Calvinism, and therefore they lay the groundwork for accepting a theological system that otherwise uh, people might be more cautious about. This isn't the whole problem, not by any means, but I think it might be the start. So firstly... Calvinists sometimes call their system the doctrines of grace. Now, I once heard uh, a young Christian say, well, well, I'm interested in doctrine and I believe in grace. Does that make me a Calvinist? Well, no, not necessarily. Listen, if you were think if you think that you were saved by anything other than grace, then you are simply not saved. Calvinism does not have a monopoly on grace any more than it has a monopoly on doctrine. So to call Calvinism the doctrines of grace is misleading because the implication is that Christians who are not Calvinists either don't believe in grace or don't understand grace and that their doctrines are somehow anti-grace which is absurd. In fact, I'm going to suggest to you that of all the methods of interpreting the Bible, the Calvinist system is in reality the least gracious of all. But uh, more of that later. Secondly, you may hear Calvinists refer to themselves as reformed. Now, this is not wrong since Calvinism is a is a Protestant theology coming out of the Reformation. However, it is something of a misnomer, since the Reformation started with Martin Luther, not John Calvin. And whilst there are some similarities between Lutheranism and Calvinism, they are not identical. Secondly, the theological nemesis of Calvinism, which is Arminianism, also comes from the time of the Reformation and is also a Protestant theology, also holding to what we call the five solas, including sola gratia or by grace alone. In fact, in theologically correct terminology, classical Arminians are more properly known as Reformed Arminians. Wow. Now that, that's going to give some people a bit of a headache, isn't it? But it shows that we should all be more careful in the terms that we throw around and, you know, maybe more precise 
in our speech and perhaps perhaps it would be a good idea to make an effort to learn uh, some church history. Thirdly, we need to see that whilst Calvinists claim that their system is the most scholarly and the most biblical, it is actually seriously deficient in both of these areas. The claims of scholarship amongst Calvinists has been greatly exaggerated. Being a Calvinist does not automatically make one an academic or a Bible scholar. And whilst I personally think academia is hyped far too much these days, it must be said that there are just as many scholars on the Arminian side, uh, just as many uh, Greek experts as on the Calvinist. The difference is Arminian theology certainly historically, has been far more exegetical, uh, being primarily taught in the context of Bible commentaries. So things like John Wesley's explanatory notes on the New Testament and on the his notes on the Old Testament, uh, Benson's Bible commentary and so on. Whilst Calvinism has leaned more on systematic theology, uh, probably following examples like Calvin's Institutes, and and I think the problem with that, uh, what's wrong with that, the snare, if you like, is that putting the theology before the biblical context relies more on theorizing and philosophizing. Hence, almost all the systematic theology books coming out at the moment, almost all, are Calvinist. And this adds to the misapprehension that Calvinists are more scholarly and Arminians less so. The fourth issue with Calvinism involves its five points, which I'll just go through briefly, but but in a little bit of detail. So point number one, the T in tulip, was total depravity. Now, it may surprise you to know that Arminians also believe in total depravity depravity. See, Arminianism is in parts different to Calvinism, but it is not the total opposite of Calvinism. For an Arminian, total depravity means that the corruption of sin has reached every area of one's character. But it does not mean that we are not able to do any good. Jesus uh, corrects this assumption when he said, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So, the inability to do good is towards God. As Paul says, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. But even non-Christians can show kindness Whereas the Calvinist system harbours uh, unreal views, I think, about men, imagining them all to be uh, murderous and demented, only held in check by the laws of the state and uh, and perhaps the fear of incarceration. Uh, point two, this is the U in Tulip, unconditional election. This is the view that only a special group of people have been arbitrarily selected for salvation by God and therefore necessarily the rest of humanity have been created purely so that God can punish them for eternity. The word unconditional makes it clear that Calvinists do not believe that anyone had a choice in this. So that if we take a verse like uh, John 1 verse 12, but as many as as received him, To them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Under the Calvinist system, those that received him could not have done otherwise, and those that received him not could not have done otherwise either. Which makes me wonder then, why is God going to punish those who received him not, since that is what God wanted them to do in the first place? Okay, point three is uh, the L in Tulip, limited atonement. Now, I said earlier on that I think that, uh, ironically, the Calvinist system of theology, uh, the so-called 
doctrines of grace is the least gracious of all. And I think the L in tulip shows why. According to Calvinism, Jesus was not the saviour of the world, only the saviour of the unconditionally elect. Even though 1 John 2 verse 2 says he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Calvinism teaches that Jesus only died for the unconditionally elect. And you may notice, by the way, how these doctrines take a biblical idea, such as election, grace, and so on, and they add a prefix, they add another word that subtly changes its meaning. So yes, the Bible does teach atonement, but it doesn't teach limited atonement. Yes, the Bible does teach election, but it doesn't teach unconditional election. Okay, so point four, this is the I in tulip, irresistible grace. This means, as you might guess, that no one is able to resist God's grace. Calvinists have uh, what they like to call a high view of God. That is, God is sovereign and cannot be resisted. But being sovereign, uh, why does that mean that God can't be resisted? Stephen says in Acts 7.51 to those Jews that have rejected Jesus, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Okay, and then finally, point five, the perseverance of the saints. Uh, So this is important to understand. This is not exactly the same as once saved, always saved. For the Calvinists, God's unconditional election and irresistible grace are the reasons why the saints will persevere to the end. There's no idea of choosing to follow God or responding to God Uh, walking in the spirit rather than walking in the flesh, you will do whatever God has decided you will do. And there is no danger of, uh, well, what should we say, blowing it for the genuine Christian. Yet I wonder then why the Bible is just so full of warnings about falling away. John says, um, be not deceived. Uh, Paul urges us to hold to the faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck. Why does the writer to the Hebrews say, if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Whilst we consider the questions that I've raised regarding the consistency of Calvinist teaching with biblical doctrine, let us now consider the consistency of Calvinism with itself. And this is where Calvinism, I think, starts to drift away from the text of the scriptures and enter into a far more uh, sort of theoretical, metaphysical, philosophical understanding of God. If Calvinism is true and salvation is ultimately a done deal with a ticket to heaven that you can never be that can never be revoked, then how do I know that I'm a Christian? If a Calvinist starts to look at his or her actions, what they do, what they don't do, then their Calvinist conscience will say, "Uh, uh, uh, that's work salvation. If he or she looks to the time when they chose to follow Jesus, no, 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 that will be the error of decisional regeneration. That's almost Arminianism. But doesn't the Bible teach that the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God? Now, here's a big problem for Calvinists. Here's a problem in general for people who subscribe completely and unreservedly to this particular theological system. John Calvin taught a doctrine called evanescent grace. This is a doctrine of temporal 
grace, in which God overcomes a non-elect person's total depravity and total inability by giving them an effectual or irresistible grace, but only temporarily until God later withdraws that grace. Here's what John Calvin himself says. Let no one think that those who fall away were of the predestined, called according to the purpose and truly sons of the promise. For those who appear to live piously may be called sons of God, but since they will eventually live impiously and die in that impiety, God does not call them sons in his foreknowledge. There are sons of God who do not yet appear so to us, but now do so to God. And there are those who, on account of some arrogated or temporal grace, are called so by us, but are not so to God. This is a quote from Concerning the Eternal Predestination of God, page 66. Did you hear it? Temporal grace. So God was only playing with them. It was a divine joke or possibly a means of further punishment by deception. Uh, he made them think they were Christians, but they never actually were. I mean, it's just horrible. How, how any Calvinist can know the joy of eternal assurance when such horrible doctrines are being put forth uh, and put forth they must be to explain why so many who follow Christ are drawn aside and enticed by the cares of the world and by the deceitfulness of riches after all how can a Christian fall away and be lost uh, if the five points of Calvinism are true so Calvinists talk about having a high view of God but it isn't the concept of a God who, well, effectively lies, that's just about the lowest view of God you could have. Isn't the view of a saviour who could have died for everyone but chose not to a lesser saviour? OK, the fifth problem with Calvinism is what we call the, the ordo salutis, that is the order of salvation. Now, listen, Calvinists believe that God regenerates a person first. In other words, they're born again first and then they are able to believe. One Calvinist preacher put it like this. A man is not saved because he believes in Christ. He believes in Christ because he is saved. Yet in Acts 16.31, we read, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Clearly, salvation is not coming before believing. believing. It is a consequence of believing. That is the correct order. Therefore, Calvinism has an incorrect understanding of the order of salvation and is therefore a deficient system for understanding biblical doctrine, particularly doctrine that relates to salvation. This is a serious error because it strikes at the heart of the gospel. The sixth issue for me is that Calvinism militates against evangelism and holiness. Now, Having said that, I have brothers in Christ who are Calvinists and one particularly who I have great personal admiration and love for. Remember, this is against Calvinism, not against uh, other brothers or sisters in Christ. It's against the theological system that I'm speaking. And there have been some great evangelists, uh, preachers of the gospel who have been Calvinists, George Whitfield. Uh, and C.H. Spurgeon, uh, to name but two. But I believe this is because they lived and evangelized in a manner that contradicted the system that they espoused. 
So they implored people to turn from their sins with an urgency and a conviction. But why, if the elect are chosen unconditionally? They work tirelessly to bring people to Christ. But why, if the grace of God is irresistible, then they'll be saved anyway, right? In addition, why take pains to disciple believers to walk in holiness? The saints will persevere to the end, yes? Now, you can live in contradiction to the theological system you say you follow, but with Calvinism, there will always be a means to justify the neglect of personal witness and obedience, it seems to me. Finally, um, when I hear Calvinists getting upset with Arminians, telling them that they ought to accept Calvinism as the true gospel, this after all is what uh, Spurgeon preached, why get upset? If you believe God has decreed all things, then doesn't he decree that I should be an Arminian and that I should reject Calvinism? Why, uh, speaking from a Calvinist point of view, are you trying to change the will of God? So, to summarise, these are my seven objections to Calvinism. One, Calvinism misapplies theological and doctrinal terms and therefore misleads Christians. Two, Calvinism misuses historical terms. Three, Calvinism claims scholarly superiority in a way that is false and sanctimonious. Four, Calvinism's five points are unbiblical. Five, Calvinism's ordo salutis is unbiblical. Six, Calvinism militates against evangelism and holy living. Seven, when Calvinists tell non-Calvinists they ought to accept Calvinism, they are actually arguing against the principles of Calvinism itself. Either you were unconditionally chosen or you were not. Therefore, God will reveal the truth of Calvinism to you or he will not. Which prompts an interesting question in my mind. Can you be unconditionally elect whilst theologically remaining an Arminian? Thankfully, I don't have to wrestle with such conundrums. So there you have it. Uh, if you're interested in more from me, you can check out my uh, other podcasts available on all platforms. You can check out my sermons on our YouTube channel, Stockport Evangelical Church. You can follow us on Instagram, like our Facebook page, or even come and visit us in person at St. Andrew's Community Hall, Hall Street, Stockport, SK14DA, every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. So don't forget our website, either stopportevangelical.co.uk. This is Pastor Paul Jennings saying, keep on loving the Lord and your neighbour, and don't forget, never give up. God bless you, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>